going to um, talk for about 40 minutes and then we will open it up for questions. And while I'm just setting my timer, uh, there we go, all set. Ooh, just chat amongst yourselves. Oh, <laughs> lovely. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank, welcome, everyone. Um, I would like to start by thanking Flyleaf for hosting us tonight. And congratulations to Flyleaf on being voted best bookstore of Triangle. I was voted for Flyleaf, it's my local indie. And um, thank you to the fabulous staff at Flyleaf, and they really are fabulous. Um, they organize wonderful events like this, and they hand sell books, and they go above and beyond for authors, so please be nice to your local booksellers. And while you're here, I hope all of you will buy something to support one of our local fabulous indies. We're very blessed in this area to have so many great indies, and I think sometimes we take that for granted. And then I engage with people online, and they don't have even one indie bookstore within like 30 miles. And that's, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. If anybody store. wants to open a bookstore in North Miami Beach, Florida, <laughs> call me. <laughs> there you go, heard it here. And obviously, thank you to all of you for um, turning out and uh, giving up some of your Tuesday to spend with us. And huge thanks to these two ladies, Marilyn and Rochelle, um, who have both traveled here to our corner of the universe. This is their only event for their two new releases in the Triangle area. So we are very, very lucky to have them. Um, we are going to be having kind of an organic conversation about writing. We hope you will. We hope that there are some writers. I know there are some writers in the audience, young and already published, and authors in waiting. Um, so we hope you'll have questions, but we hope that we will cover some of the ground um, that you're interested in too. Uh, and I also hope that uh, somewhere these two ladies will just take a couple of minutes to pitch their fabulous new books. Uh, crazy to leave you and when we let go um, both of these came out in May I read them back to back while I was in England last month they are both phenomenal I love them both for very different reasons I cannot recommend them highly enough they are both fantastic summer reading and um, I think that they are kind of a, a prime example of um, sort of how the three of us really connect and, and hopefully what is going to make for a good conversation tonight because basically we're all, all three of us write emotionally layered family drama, women's fiction if you want to call it that, I hate that, I don't know about you guys but I'm not a fan of that, that label women's fiction. Um, we write about dysfunctional families, messed up families, messed up relationships, the impact of mental illness on families, all that sort of stuff. Um, and yet we all do, the three of us do so in completely different ways. We have completely different voices. We write in a completely different style. Um, and I think that's what's so intriguing. And that's why I love talking to other authors because you can see how we've kind of picked at a similar premise, but woo, you know, told a completely different story from it. So obviously Marilyn, when I um, shut up and Marilyn starts talking, you'll realize that she is the queen of comedy. And uh, this, oh, one more. I add to my prop. This this is hilarious. This is absolutely hilarious. So it starts with um, possibly the most devastating thing that can happen to a woman. Uh, Lauren is 41, 42, 41. 41. She has just dieted the heck out of herself to squeeze into a size 12 wedding dress. Wedding dress. She is in the room at her synagogue waiting for her big wedding and her sister rushes in with her phone to tell her that the groom has just sent her a text, not to the bride, to the sister of the bride, to say that he's backing out. He doesn't think he's emotionally ready to, um, to get married. So this devastating moment, because it's Marilyn writing, it's Marilyn's voice, actually becomes hilarious. And, but the book also um, you know, weaves in two very dark themes, two very dark stories. Uh, there's a subplot about addiction and a subplot about weight shaming. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, Marilyn does it in such a way that it's just hilarious. And you're, you know, I was reading on the plane to England laughing out loud, which, you know, given how awful our flight was, that's pretty impressive. Um, Rochelle's book is the, now Rochelle has, starts with a similar premise too. Um, again, this should be the best moment in the heroine Aru's life. She's in this beautiful garden in Miami, 
the guy she's been dating for two years, Jude, who's a fabulous character, I love him. Um, he's a father, um, a, a widowed father of three young kids, three kids. Now one is, one is a teenager, two are younger. And he proposes to her and she can't accept. She can't accept because he doesn't know her truth. She hasn't told him her full story. And she knows, she's terrified that once he finds out the truth, he won't love her anymore because she's terrified to love. Um, and this story ripped my heart apart and put it back together in the best way. And when I got to the end, I was giving myself a hug. Like, I love this book so much, it's so <laughs> wonderful. I also had a twist in, which I didn't see coming, which made perfect sense to me, but I didn't see it coming, which I love. And um, it's, it's also basically about the really dark side of grief, guilt, you know, and how guilt can actually keep you trapped in the past and so releasing you to live the life that, that you want to deserve in the, in the present and the future. And I think my voice sort of is somewhere in between. If you've never read me, my books are a little mad. They're very quirky. They're all set in the triangle. But I have this, this weird little thing I like to write about, the impact of mental illness on families. So there's a lot of darkness in my books because you know there's, there's nothing funny about having mental illness. But a lot of the situations that you get in, as a result of, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder, which my husband and my son both battled, can actually be funny. So there's a lot of dark humor, although, um, you know, Marilyn's humor is more um, obvious. Not everyone gets my sense of humor. It makes me, oh dear, you know, is that like a weird English thing? <laughs> no one gets it, realizes I'm being ironic. Um, and um, yeah, but there's also a lot of light and a lot of hope. And I think that's where, uh, really where Rochelle and I connect that, um, you know, all my novels end up being very, very hopeful. So that's kind of that, that's kind of how we kind of intersect. But one of the other things that I discovered about the three of us, which is really interesting, is that not, we've all written in some shape or form our whole lives, but creative writing was not our first career. So we kind of came to creative writing a little later in life. So I was going to open it up for you guys to tell us. So maybe Rochelle, you could kick off. Tell us how and why you ended up in fiction and whether that had always been something you thought you would do. First, let me say thank you to, I feel like this does not work. I don't think it works. It's like a dark, it's like a dark hole right here. Okay, it's working? Okay. First, I want to just say thank you and just say that Barbara is an amazing host and, and partner and what she didn't mention is also that we are all imprint sisters. We're all in the same imprint and we've been through the ups and downs together and it's just wonderful to be here. I don't know if I need this, do I need this? It's wonderful to be here and seeing so many writers out there and being able to encourage and support and be there for one another. So thank you for organizing this and for your beautiful books that have always touched me. So, um, so I was always a journal writer. I I wasn't. I was self taught. I was self taught. I never had formal training. I was a huge reader. I would sink inside stories. I was taken away, um, and I just was you know overwhelmed with you know feelings about the places I visited in books and the and the emotions that were elicited. I never had these dreams of becoming a published author, but I wrote in my journal privately, except when my brother Rob used to go read it and he used to write in the margins little comments like, did you really do that last night? Like, I'm gonna tell Rob. So he was my first official reader. Um, I'm not nearly as funny as you. But oh, I'm, now you've been under such pressure. I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm feeling it so, down. so I'll, I'll, I'll just be quick. So I, I was actually in the music business in California. I had this great job that my kids always tell me was, you know, this much cooler than what you do now. And the company moved to New York City. They offered me my position, and um, I couldn't take my grand the grandkids away from the grandparents. So we stayed in Miami, and I was like, "Well, what? This is the first time in my life that I wasn't working. I'd been working since I was 14. What was I going to do with myself?" And you know, leaving a job after being in the working world for so long, I felt I had this identity crisis. Like, who am I? What am I? And I had elicited all these feelings and emotions. And instead of writing in my journal, I just decided that. I had a story to tell. I, I had a story to tell. It was a culmination of life experiences and my journey and you know familial relationships and um, father-daughter relationships, which is a very common theme in my novels. And I, I had no I had no outline, nothing. I sat down, I wrote the book that first year, and the rest was 
basically history. And you? Hi, everybody. I am not funny at all. No. <laughs> this is all false advertising, putting me under extreme pressure. Um, I don't think I need this. Everybody in my family talks so loud. Know, <laughs> yeah. We'll just we'll shout. Yeah, we don't even need telephones in my oh, family. <laughs> my sister calls me from Long Island, and I can hear her in Connecticut, and she's not even on the phone. <laughs> so anyway, um, I was born wanting to be a writer. In fact, I'm, I'm almost positive that I was holding a pen, which might have been dangerous for my mother. Um, and I just had no idea what being a writer was because at the time, don't add now, okay? I was born in 53. Don't add, I said not to add. Um, at the time, you know, women were either gonna be teachers or nurses, yeah. okay? Or, or get married and not have a career. And I had no idea what I could be with a, with a writing degree. Uh, but I didn't wasn't good at anything else. I got a 56 on the math regents in New York. <laughs> that seemed rather hopeless to me. And um, in, in, I uh, just knew I wanted to be a writer forever. And I got I wasn't sure. I thought maybe you could like get married and live in a place with an attic and with one hand push the baby carriage while you typed with the other. I thought that was the future, you know, that's the only future I could see and where I get to write. But I went to NYU, I majored in journalism, I got out, I wound up with a job at Seventeen Magazine, and um, I uh, turned that into working in advertising, and I turned that into owning my own advertising agency in Connecticut. But when push came to shove, I still wanted to not write, but publish a novel. I had written some novels, but I had never done the work that it takes to publish it. And you're not gonna believe this, but the work to pu get published is harder than the work to write the book, mm -hmm. okay? You really, if there's anyone out there who's written a book and is looking for an agent, looking for a publisher, don't give up, just keep going. Um, I gave up with the first book I wrote and I just put it in a drawer and you're not going to believe this but if you put a book in a drawer it does not get published. <laughs> okay. With Lift and Separate which is my first book that got published I worked so hard on trying to get it published and I was very very lucky for it to happen. So that's how I got to here. I got a two book deal at Lake Union. I wrote Husbands and Other Sharp Objects. My sharp object is right there. He looks nice, but he's sharp. Um, and, uh, and now my third book is Crazy to Leave You. You know, I wanna, I wanna just add something to this because I know we have a lot of writers here in the audience and about giving up is mm -hmm. such an important point. Um, We've picked a terrible business, if you don't already know that. It's a really difficult business, and it's, it's even more difficult today in, in the world that we're living in. Um, when I wrote that first novel, I said the rest was history, but that, that novel went under the bed, not in the drawer. It sat under the bed for years, and I took it out, and I worked with an editor, and I tried to find an agent, and I got rejected by nine million agents, and then I wrote another book, and I got rejected by nine million agents, and I decided to self-publish my first two books. And there was a lot of, a lot of unsolicited advice about self-publishing and the credibility behind it, and you're tanking your career and whatnot. And I, you know, I say to any writer, you have to know your goals for your work, why you're doing this. And you have to be really realistic and manage your expectations. I wanted a tangible piece of evidence out in the world that I had written this book. And I self-published my first two books and they did very well, um, enough to parlay that into, I found an agent and I got a deal with Lake Union and I had my last three books with Lake Union. But here's the, the really interesting piece. The first novel, the self-published novel, hit the USA Today bestseller list. I didn't even know until five years later, I was on Publishers Marketplace. I was, that's how, that's how naive I was to this whole business. I wasn't even on Publishers Marketplace. I had no idea what was going on with my book. And it hit a list, but I didn't know that. 
And we don't always have those accolades to lift us up and, and encourage us to keep going. So the moral of the story is keep going no matter what. No matter what, I didn't have that accolade to buoy me through some of my most difficult times. And you might not have those either, but you just have to keep focused on your goal. And it's as hard to stay published as it is to get published. Yeah. So you guys probably noticed that the pub date for my book, if you bought a copy of The Promise Between Us, was five years ago. I haven't had a novel published since then. So I'm actually not with Lake Union anymore because they passed not once but twice, which I think is a very impressive for the same publisher to pass on the same story twice um, and now the book is on general submission and and you know it's been on general submission for a couple of months now and everyone goes are you freaking out and I went no because I'm writing the next one and that's what you have to do you just have to keep writing um, and you just can never give up so I knew my story is that I, when I was five years old I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to grow up to be um, an author lady, but I was never actively encouraged to think of creative writing as a potential career. But I always wrote my whole life in different shapes or forms. As some of you know, my son is an award-winning poet who's been published since he was eight years old and is currently doing his MFA in poetry. Um, but I, the first thing I ever had published was a poem when I was 10 in a national magazine. I didn't get my first pub deal to write before my 50th birthday. So I actually thought I wanted to, be, I went off and I became a history major, which in actual fact has been a crucial part of my writing because I am a huge researcher. I build my stories by doing these one-on-one -on -one interviews with people living the experiences that I want to write about. I love research. It floats my boat. I, my opening line of the gin club is Luca Hayward had a groundhog problem. And I can tell you, you can spend days researching groundhog behavior and interviewing people in this area about groundhogs, and it's fascinating. And Claus is fascinating, you all know about groundhogs. But, um, you know, I, so I, I ended up in, in public relations, pretty much like these two, really. And um, I was writing press releases all the time. It was still writing to me, and I did some freelance journalism on the side. But it wasn't until I married an American professor and moved stateside and I couldn't get a job because I had really weird work experience. I'm a history major who'd worked in the London fashion industry. So I started writing my first novel. And I think if it's if there's some if if you have a great passion and you've always wanted to do it, this young lady here is really impressive because she's living the dream now in high school. Um, you know, if you always want to do it but you've never done it once you once you kind of pulled it out from under the bed. It's like scratching an itch, you just can't stop. So I spent 20 years teaching myself, you know, the art and craft. The craft is obviously still ongoing and the business side of writing. Um, as I said, I got my first pub deal right before my 50th birthday. Um, and I've been with two, I've, I'm only traditionally published, I've been with two publishers, Mirror, which is an imprint of Harlequin, which is an imprint of HarperCollins, and Free with Lake Union. So that's kind of our that's kind of our background. Um, so, do you want to tell us a little bit about your writing process? Sure. Uh, well, do you have one? Some people say mm, they don't. I think everybody does. Um, first, let me say that unlike Barbara, I do not like to research. <laughs> so I tend to write about things I already know about. So, like overeating, I know a lot about. So it was easy to write that for Crazy to Leave You. Um, uh, why we write what we write. Yeah. I am, um, I, since I was a kid, I love anything about a family. I love being in a family. I love any TV show that's about, that's about a family. And I especially like uh, very, um, depressed family stories. The more depressed the people are in the story, the happier I am. <laughs> but you put a happy spin on it. Why I, no, I that's that? what I write, but I'm saying if I had to, if I had to choose somebody I else's, I want like really like depressed that. people. I want people who are, I come from a very dysfunctional family, so unless the that's book has, yeah, a, has a dysfunctional do. family that's more dysfunctional than mine, you know, what's the point? Because I already know the story. So um, I love writing about families and I love writing what I know. And um, 
I that's what I write about. And I add a sense of humor to it because that's just the way I am. My family, no matter what happens, things that are worse than being left at the altar at 41, we find humor in it. I mean, sometimes we find humor in things we really should not be finding humor in, but among ourselves, we, we were able to do that. And um, so if you read my book, if you read my books, you'll, you'll always find a family. You'll always find a woman who is very, becomes either is or will become very strong. I have two daughters and I wanted to give them that to be very, very strong women. And they are, and that's the character I write. Um, somebody who gets knocked down and, you know, maybe she's on the floor crying a little, but she's gonna get up, okay? And when she gets up, it's like with a sense of humor and with the help of her friends and her family, and she goes on. And so that's, all three of my books have that kind of, um, uh, background and um, you know I write what I know about and what and what I love and I love families and I love humor well it's a bit interesting when I was reading um, crazy to leave you I kept thinking oh my god this is like hanging out with Marilyn yes because I can hear <laughs> yes, you you know voice. Lauren is in her advertising voice. there's also another kind of yes, serious thread that I didn't yeah. that I didn't talk about is I didn't mention yeah is is you know she she takes on sort of male whatever in the workplace she does she, she i mean she's she really which is so sad because you know this book is written today um i was in the advertising business um it's almost 20 years ago now and it's unfortunate that a lot of the things i saw where um you know that madman epic where women are being treated poorly you know hasn't changed so i was able to use it, which sort of makes me sad, but she comes out on top anyway because she finds her own way to do things. And there's a lot of humor in it. <laughs> what? And there's a lot of humor in it. Yes. So what? I, I want to come back to something you said, Rochelle, when you were talking about your first manuscript, you had all these emotions and you, you weren't journaling, you decided to put it into fiction. I think that's, I think that's another huge area of research that sometimes writers starting out the gate don't think about everything that happens to you in life is research, mm -hmm. it's character research. Yeah. Because, you know, I remember doing a Donald Moss workshop, I'm mm -hmm. a huge fan of the craft guru, Donald Moss, and, um, you know, he talks about excavating your emotions and sort of finding your, your deeper emotion, not the surface emotion going deeper. And, you know, when you're having, when something traumatic is happening to you, you might think that the last thing that you want to do is write. That's actually a really good time to write mm -hmm. because you can, it actually becomes therapy, but you can also give all those incredible emotional layers to a character. Um, so, you know, when I'm really angry at the world or I'm grieving or whatever, I gotta write something. Um, so uh, similar to Marilyn, I, I write what I know. Um, you know, all of us have had our own experiences and our own journeys, and I took my experiences and of those of people around me. Um, I love relationships, I love romance, I love um, family dynamics, and I've just taken little pieces of the people and the players in my life, and I've taken those emotions, and I've turned it into fiction. So I like to see the journey, similar also to Marilyn and your characters as well. I like to see a woman who is struggling and seeing her arc and seeing how she grows and seeing how she looks inward to make these, you know, adjustments in her life. Instead of looking for the external factors, she looks inward and it's introspection and it's personal growth. So I, I see so many strong women around me who've had these incredible experiences so I like to sort of document those journeys yeah. and leave and leave the reader with an important message or some you know theme that they need to maybe say the, the one of the most amazing things is when a reader reaches out to you and says oh my god I didn't even realize I was doing that and I yeah. saw I was saw myself in the mirror in your book and I just you know it was just life-changing for me yeah. I like when so oh go ahead no. I like my my biggest compliment is when somebody tells me they were reading my book in bed 
and their husband got annoyed with the laughing, so he went in the other room. <laughs> I mean, that, uh, well, with, you know, that, 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 my, that, warms, <laughs> that warms my heart. And the other thing, talking about people you know, I never pick up someone whole. I always no. pick characteristics, sure. okay? And the funny part about picking characteristics is people don't recognize themselves. And so in um, uh, Husbands and Other Sharp Objects, no, in Lift and should, Separate. Should, should your sharp object leave at this point if you're going to talk about recognizing themselves? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My sharp object over there. But I, I wrote this scene where this woman who's recent, who's going through a divorce, it goes to a Chinese restaurant on a date, on a blind date, and um, I based the guy who was taking her on the blind date on my girlfriend's husband, who is impossible to go to a restaurant with. So this is a first blind date. The guy has to be there before six because then the price goes up. He walks into the Chinese restaurant and goes right up to the buffet without ever sitting down. Um, he does everything possible to be a total annoyance, to make her think, why am I even putting myself on the market again? Anyway, the friend's husband called me up and said, I read your book, which is rare because not that many men read my, read my books. I said, oh, that's great. He goes, you know what my favorite scene was? <laughs> <laughs> that guy in the Chinese restaurant. Seriously? Yes, yes. You didn't know? No. What did you say? Did you, did you enlighten him? Did you say? No. Oh, uh, no. Oh. Are you kidding? I go, wasn't he delightful? <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite characteristic the, in him? Did the wife <laughs> notice her husband in that? Sometimes um, the wife, someone no, will she, no, she didn't say anything to me about oh, it. I'd be like, she didn't, oh I, I was a little afraid she would re husband. she would might recognize him when I made him so intolerable, right. but she didn't. <laughs> I guess she loves him, so she doesn't see it. <laughs> Whatever. So, well, my dad thinks every book is about him. <laughs> so, that is it. <laughs> yes, there's Some pieces level. of him for sure, but he'll be like. Oh, so you killed me off on page four. Thanks. That was really nice. And, and I'm like, it's not you, Dad. I promise. It's like, it's more representative. Like anyone that you're, like what you're doing in real, it's not him, but it's just pieces of him. And right. it makes for great fodder in a novel. My husband loves to tell everyone that I killed him off in the backstory of my debut novel because my heroine is a young widow and her husband is a... a a sort of shining light professor at UNC who Ooh. dies teaching Ooh. grads. He has a he dies for Widowmaker heart attack. That sounds like, a little familiar. Um, I don't think he's in his early forties. He dies. No, no, Widowmaker was in another book. Anyway, he dies of a heart attack in his forties, and so he's he's off page for the whole thing. So when I was launching the unfinished garden, my husband saying, "You know, she killed me off in the backstory, <laughs> and then she had an affair with this this hot guy called James." You know, so. and then he actually came up with the premise for a book I should write when the husband is convinced that his wife, the heroine, is having an affair with her husband, her, her not her husband, oh, my brain, her her hero. Thank you. I you know obviously I did not write that one. I was sort of disturbed you came up with that idea. Is that quite a good Maybe idea? Because it actually it one. turned out because I was going to we ended up brainstorming it together, and he was going to be schizophrenic and and be a professor, but um, and she was going to be a New York Times best-selling author. But it turned out she was actually crazy. She really did think she was having an affair with her hero. Oh, wow. She was having like an imaginary relationship. And then I took it to my great friend in England, and she started brainstorming with me. She said, "Oh no." Wait, the house is haunted. Like, oh, that's so cool. Of course, I never write this thing. So you have great conversations with people about books. I might be crazy because I think I'm having an affair with George Clooney. Oh, <laughs> you said she was. I know so you are. You are. I, uh, George, George Clooney loves my books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if you don't follow Marilyn on social media, you need to because you'll yeah. see George Clooney blurbing all her books. <laughs> One day we'll meet. <laughs> so let's talk about, so we talked about kind of um, things from our lives that feed into our novels. And I think somehow, sometimes it's even just like small things that, that go off that lead us to something. I'm looking at my great friend Leslie, who's sitting in the back row. Um, so one of my favorite scenes that I've ever written, I call it the Psycho Squirrel scene. It's in my Goodreads Choice Awards nominee um, 
book, The Perfect Sun. Mm -hmm. And um, it happened at a point where I needed some humor in the book because it's, you know, the, the mother has a major heart attack, a widow maker, she's one of the widows, on a plane coming to land at RDU. And it's a father son story. And the father and son are trying to connect to each other um, while the wife is obviously very sick in hospital. And Leslie and I get together on Fridays and, and drink. And she's saying, you know what? We've got squirrels. I've got squirrels in my linen closet. And I was like two gins in and I went, squirrels in your linen closet. And I wrote it down on a napkin. And then I said, you know, can I come over and take pictures of it? And she went, yeah. And she kept, bless her, she kept, she kept the, the squirrel nest in the towels in her linen closet for 48 hours so I could go and take pictures. So the psycho squirrel scene is based on my hero and his son wake up in the house and they're hearing scrabbling in the bathroom and there's a squirrel in the linen closet and he has to like try and take it out with a loo brush. And I had so much fun writing that and it just came out of a drunk Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know what's no, gonna end up in your- stories all around yeah. us. Yeah, but so how, how, does that, how does that lead into setting? I set I set my books in places I know. Like I, you know what the thing is, like people tell me I should be a stand-up comedian, but I don't like to stand up. <laughs> and that is true about my entire life. Okay, if it can be done sitting down, great. So um, I put my settings where I've been, and um, I grew up in Queens, in New York in case uh, anyone's here on 170th Street, if anyone's here from Queens. And um, then I lived in Greenwich Village. And then my husband and I moved up to New England. We live uh, outside of Hartford because they wouldn't let us into Hartford. And um, I spend a lot of time in Maine. And I've traveled quite a bit, so I could, there are the places that I can bring in. But when it's set in the main story, I really like to set it in a place I really know well. So um, I think in all three books, there are people who are either living in Manhattan or living in Connecticut or New Jersey in a suburb, um, and they go on vacation to Cape Cod or Maine or places that I've been a lot. Um, if I ever go somewhere different, I'll be able to write uh, another setting. How about you, Michelle? Actually, uh my first book I started out with a theme and then I went to a place and it was a familiar place it was Miami and LA because I'd lived in both places but I have found my last couple of books um, I get a sense of place I feel something I literally feel something when I'm somewhere and I say I need to set a book here and oftentimes it sprouts from that um, so my husband my husband is here with my dog on his lap um, <laughs> Oh, well, good. He's sleeping. He's such a good child. Um, we went to Vizcaya a couple years ago, and I live in Miami, and you would think that we go to Vizcaya on the beach all the time because there are attractions, but we don't. We take it for granted. And I just was so blown away and mesmerized by Vizcaya. And the book, actually, when we let go, had a lot more Vizcaya, and that was all taken out. But I knew that wherever I was going with this particular theme was going to be at Biscaya and also in North Carolina. So uh, we have a home in, in Beach Mountain and I've been going to camp in Hendersonville since I was four. So my memories in childhood, the smell of camp and just that North Carolina has a smell. I don't care what anyone says. I don't know what it is. If somebody wants to bottle it up and tell me what it is, great. It is just nostalgic and it, I, it, I, I, seeps from my pores like I love Those, it, the, it just... the, the scenes set here in North Carolina are, are amazing there's a mm -hmm. really strong sense of place in this novel once Avery goes back to her family farm it's a fictitious town it's crystal yeah. but I think it was I named it crystal because I felt like she wasn't seeing things clearly and crystal oh, was yeah yeah, but it was really based on loosely on beach mountain. But I just, when I'm in nature, I'm so inspired. I do so much of my best writing in the mountains and amongst nature and mountain vistas. Yeah. And my books are set here in the Triangle, and sometimes they jump the pond back to England, although less and less. Uh, the new one is, the, the one that's on submission is, is set entirely in Orange County, because I just love writing about Orange County. And I like to use actual places. Mm, so sure. I have Flyleaf yeah. in my, the book that's on submission, Flyleaf is mentioned in The Promise Between Us. 
I've got the uh, River Walk at Hillsborough. I've got Purple Crow Books, um, the Vidory Chocolate Factory in Raleigh. I talk about finding settings. I had to. I was. I. I was between book club events in in Raleigh, and you know, I'm. It's it's quite a trek from where I'm at towards Hillsborough, towards Raleigh, and so someone had said I could stay overnight with them on Friday night. And um, I thought, well, what am I going to do all day, you know, for the next day, or whatever, until until my other book club event? And I thought, well, I'll just I'll go. There's a contemporary art museum in Raleigh. I'll I'll go there. And I went there, and I went, oh, yeah, I need to have a scene set here. And and something huge happened while I was there. And I parked outside the Bidari Chocolate Factory, Bidari Chocolate Factory, and it's Bidari. Uh, Shan gave me a Bidari chocolate. Um, and and then so I set a scene there, and and it was it was just there's something you know when you get when you find yourself in a place, and it just sort of that that little kind of writing sense kind of kicks in in your stomach. You think, oh yeah, yeah, I want to set something here. I mean, because you know a, a setting should never just be a character isn't just walking across the stage or they're interacting with the place where they are, either in a good way or a bad way. Um, and I think that's a very powerful tool that authors can use to to really think about how a character reacts to a setting. Well, that's why it's interesting. The cover for When We Let Go, I feel like that was Avery and her garden. Yeah. And, you know, her yeah. seeds were planted and how she, yeah. she grew by from the beginning to the end of the book. Yeah. And it was based on that backdrop yeah. of going yeah, home to her right. family farm. Yeah. With the seed plants. Yeah, yeah. her baggage. It's beautiful cover. It is. It's yeah. actually it's one of my favorite covers. And Thank you. So, um, a kind of weird story. I was going to ask, how do we find our stories, or do they find us? I don't know. I think you guys have kind of answered that, really. Yeah. Well, I, I um, think the current story. This um, is your work in progress, right? No, no, no. This story. Crazy to crazy leave you. Right, I, uh, I just kept talk. thinking <laughs> of what would it be like to be left at the altar later in life, you know, because she's 41. And I kept imagining that, and I took it off, I took off from there. I don't outline, I just write as I go. Um, her sister, Margot, came to me about halfway through, and I all of a sudden thought to myself, I really love this character, I want to write more of this character. And that's the kind of thing that grabs me. If I if I'm falling in love with the character, I have to keep keep going. Um, and so in my developmental edits, which is the edits you do after the publisher buys the book, I just knew that that's, that's the way I wanted to go. I wanted to make the sister the second banana. <laughs> I never had that little second banana. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> no, I think so, you're, you're, what you're saying is also as our characters take us places, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, some, we, I'm sure you guys have talked ad nauseum about plotting and pantsing and everybody's done it differently. But, you know, you sit down and you're in your story and you're in your head and sometimes the character just takes you into a, another area that you weren't anticipating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think what's really interesting is what you were saying at the beginning about sort of taking little bits of people and people mm -hmm. that necessarily recognize themselves. I often start, I have this love for secondary characters. And the problem is that the more, as I get further into the story, the secondary characters kind of take over a little bit and I have to kind of keep them in their box. And I don't, I don't know what that is, but I often, it often, a secondary character will often come from just something that I see in someone mm -hmm. else. It'll, you know, you always have your people radar on, right? If you're a writer and like airports are just like the best place mm -hmm. to, collect mannerisms to note down body language. I love weird body language. You know, I'm always watching to see what people do because that always ends up becoming a little notes. Um, and, and you know, you'll take, you'll take this little seed that could have been inspired by a real person, but then the moment that you start bringing that character to life on the page, they just become themselves. So they, they take off completely. Um, I know like with my debut, The Unfinished Garden, my, one of my mother's oldest friends had this huge fight with my mother because the unfinished girl, my heroine, ends up back in England um, in a fictitious village that's not actually my mother's, wasn't my mother's village, it was actually my sister's village. 
But um, this, this friend of my mother insisted that all the characters in England were based on real people in their village. And she was trying to identify them. Mm-hmm. I was going, oh my God, I'm going to get sued by all these little old ladies. <laughs> they think that I, you know, like turn them into awful people or something. So, um, yeah, but I never really think of it that way. I might, you know, there might be a seed, but then when a character just becomes themselves and you know, I edit aloud, and I edit aloud by character. So I read every character all the way through, whether that character has a point of view, chapter or not. And sometimes, you know, I can be quite far into developmental edits, and I realize, oh my God, that, that character would never say that. I've lost their voice. That's somebody else speaking the dialogue. It's not them. Um, so we have 20 minutes left. So we're going to open it up to the audience. And if no one has questions, that's fine, because we're going to get Rochelle and Marilyn to pitch their new books to us. Oh. So. <laughs> Does anybody got Wait, questions? Oh, well, what we're working on, or what these Oh, look, these ones. Oh, we'll talk a little bit more about. Yeah. I mean, we can keep talking. Like Any questions about what you just said? Yeah. Can I ask you a question about what you just said? Yeah. Because you said you read the character aloud. But do you just read about that character, like go through just that? I'm right. just trying to understand the process. Oh yeah, no, what I do with, because I, I write multi-viewpoint, so in Promise Between Us, I have five points of view. I don't really know what I thought I was doing when I did that. It wasn't meant to be five. Started off with three, and then Maisie, the 11-year-old, she had to have her own chapters. Mm-hmm. And then Jake, a very important view, second character, just you know, he kept wanting more room, so I thought, oh, well, Jake has to have chapters too. Um, so what I do is I start by reading um, the, the, the lead point of view character, every chapter. So for example, um, the gin club, the one that's on submission, my hero is Luca. I read every chapter of Luca's out loud. And then the other point of view character is his 15 year old son, Xander. And then I went through and I read every one of Xander's chapters out loud. And then Jake from The Promise Between Us comes back in the gin club. I went through, he's the most important secondary character, doesn't have point of view chapters. I read every scene that Jake is in, every piece of his dialogue, and then I did it for all the other secondary characters. Any scene where they were in, even you know if it's not their point of view, if someone is watching their body language, watch how they sit, like Jake, for example, has really specific body language um, that I figured out because I put him in a white room. I was having a hard time connecting with this character when I first found him. Uh, he had something very dark in his backstory and he was keeping it from me. I didn't know what it was. So I put him in a white interview room and I watched how he sat down and he comes in, he sits like, he man spreads and goes like this and goes, how's it going, darling? And you're like, oh my God, that's Jake. So, you know, as soon as I'm reading him aloud, if I've lost that, how's it going, darling? And you know, he's a country boy, he's actually a Hollywood actor, but he's a country boy at heart. And when he's faking it, he puts the country back in a bit. And so as soon as I'm reading him aloud, I know if I've lost his voice. Or if it's, a, if it's, if it's phrased in a strange way, Leslie, um, you know, has always been my beta reader. And she's really good at picking out when I've slipped into, when I, I say my British showing, I've slipped into being English without realizing I'm writing an American character. Um, and that because that's quite hard because after 35 years in the States I don't really know anymore what's an Englishism what's an Americanism and what's a Barbaraism because I make stuff up the whole time and then I don't really know um, so yeah I just I just find it helpful because I to me, I'm all about character I'm all about character and my bugbear as a reader is I really have a hard time reading a book if all the characters especially point of view characters sound exactly the same because no character should sound like any other character. And I, you know, editing aloud slows you down. Obviously it takes quite a while, but you can have your computer read your manuscript to you, which is actually quite helpful because it can be in a really automated voice. And so you've got to pay attention because you're actually not hearing the characters, you're hearing the words, which is kind of interesting. interesting. Do either of you edit aloud? Here's the person I paid five dollars to ask a question. Oh. <laughs> I paid her twenty. Um, so I didn't pay her at all. A, she's such a big tipper. Um, so I'm glad you brought up because that was going to be part of my question. Was I want to hear what each of you are currently working on now? Um, so glad you'll be touching on that. And my other question. 
No, just keep talking. Just keep chatting. My other question is, so in the book blogging Instagram world, um, I know chiclet used to be a term, and no one really liked that. So then it's women's fiction. And that's what I see a lot of books that come across my way are labeled women's fiction. It's a huge hashtag. And I just said, don't really make that term. So would you prefer like contemporary fiction, uh, literary fiction? What kind well, of term? Just so I know. Yeah. I mean, my problem is that, I mean, women's fiction by the original definition is meant to be the emotional journey of the lead female character. But you know, all books should, all novels should really be about the lead characters, emotional development, emotional arc, whatever. But I have written two books with male protagonists and that's problematic for a lot of people. So a lot of people will say, then I get into this thing, well, you know, you've got male characters and you, you know, you're giving them space on the page. So you're not technically women's fiction, but but the stupid thing is that all my books have exactly the same tone. They're all basically family drama. They're all emotionally layered in a family drama about dysfunctional families and the impact of mental illness on, on um, families. And the, the gin club, one of the reasons I've been out in the weeds for five, five years um, uh, was because, you know, I was told to write motherhood. That's what you do really well, Barbara, write motherhood. And I said, it's not actually. What I like doing, what I think I do well, is to write messed up middle-aged men. And I want to write more messed up middle-aged men. <laughs> motherhood, I write messed up middle-aged men. Motherhood. And apparently I was told there's no market for, for stories about men's emotional lives and male bonding. And I go, Ted Lasso, guys. <laughs> Who doesn't love Ted Lasso? Also Jonathan Tropper. I mean, he's not called women's fiction. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I just think women's fiction is very limiting. Yeah. And that's what it means. I actually to. prefer family drama or book club family fiction. Family fiction, book club yeah. fiction. But there's I, no I like fiction. just fiction. Fiction, there you go. Like, I, just I, fiction. like I, I don't understand why we have to uh, differentiate and especially like Jonathan Tropper if a man writes what if if a man's name's on a book it's fiction right that same book if I put my name on it would be women's fiction go figure right, right. Um, it's just uh, it's just a, a very very odd thing and it's really crazy because women read the most books yes it's just a you know I will take my hashtag no, no I, use it. I, I use it. I use it all the time. I use it all the time. Listen, it's it. important right now yeah. because it's a hashtag. It so I'm like until some someone it, comes up with something else. Some of it is like we'll put uh, female author, you know, woman author. That is a, a hashtag we use a lot. But um, I agree that you guys should not be your fiction should not be labeled as strictly women's fiction because anybody. It. So the thing is, it's also, I mean, you know, once once your book, if you're traditionally publishing, you don't have any say on how your book's going to be marketed. Mm -hmm. So my debut, which is the only book of mine that's classic women's fiction, halfway through, Mira kind of decided that it should be romance. So it's sort of, if you look, look on Amazon, it's actually in the romance category as well as women's fiction. And then, of course, that really upset romance readers because it wasn't I mean it's fine if they wanted it to be a romance book we should have edited it as a romance book so one of the best reviews one star reviews I ever had on Amazon was some poor woman who thought she was going off for a hot weekend with her new boyfriend with a contemporary romance and she got this this book with a deeply tortured hero who is brilliant and, and gorgeous but has Hold obsessive compulsive disorder and her review was and do you know what there was no sex in this book and there was only one kiss and I was just cracking up because I was going you know because a lot of people are slammed for having sex in their books I've been slammed for not having sex yeah. so but it has you have to mark you know it, it the publisher puts the labels on and then you're stuck with the categories they put you in so we all put women's fiction the worst yeah. review I ever got on Amazon oh, one star and you know what the comment was I did not order this weed whacker yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so follow up question. So, do the publishers have data that shows that women are not interested in exploring um, a man's emotional life as a lead character? Like, can they back that with anything? No, but I heard that many times when I was working on the gym. 
Well, who's saying that? Like, where are they getting this information from? That's a mystery to me. <laughs> well, I mean, do do most? I'm, I'm assuming that they have some market research there, and that their numbers are showing women are interested in women's lives. Yeah. Is, is, I mean, well, I think know? a lot of it is, you know, a lot of the conversations that I've had with my agent about the gin club, um, because she had reservations about it when we when we took it out, was, um, um, you know, that most editors are female, most readers are female, and that the market, as she was seeing it as an agent, the books that, that she was selling successfully and the ones that were floundering, on her clients, you know, it was that the, the the women's fiction market had got kind of broader and it was tightening up. But then when I finally got the final version to her, she said, you know, the market is beginning to shift again in your favor because editors are wanting things that are a little different and you're a little different. But that also works against you because, you know, if you're a little different, that means it's a risk. I've always been a risk because I'm I am a little different. Not everyone wants to read about dysfunctional families. Not everyone wants to read about postpartum obsessive compulsive disorder, which is, um, you know, the, I think, the premise. I think people of, just want good writing. Sure well, you see, right. I that's yeah. what I think. That's yeah. what I think. People just want good writing. But um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, agents and editors are sort of following the market. And um, I guess so. I don't know. But then you get a breakthrough novel that, that surprises everyone. And then it, you know, then there's another. But that's why you've got to just keep writing what you want to write and write with heart and passion and make it authentic. I mean, we were talking we about, were this, just talking yeah, about this, yeah, before before we came out, and you know, I was saying, look, the bottom line is, you know, if I'm not making money, I, I'm not doing this to make money. I'm doing this because I love writing and it's what I want to do. So I want to write my passion. Damn it, I'm going to write my stuff later. You know, yeah. so although the one I'm writing at the moment, of course, is a mother daughter story. So go figure. But Oh, oh yeah, we have 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes. And this lady here has a question, so. So I was just curious, when you all are writing, if you hit a point where you just, you're not feeling inspired and you just can't get the words to come out right, how do you go about kind of conquering that? You keep writing. You keep writing. The next day you get up and you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. You write the same, for me, same time every day. And then finally you'll actually have a good day. And you'll go, this is why I did it. But there's only one real rule for writing, it's butt in the chair. You have to sit down and write. As long as you're writing, it doesn't matter if it's crap. You give yourself permission to write crap, that's what I do. Every first draft is crap. So just get it down on the page. Get it down on the page. I just finished my first draft of my seventh book. And there were some days I was like, this is such crap, but I just put it on the page. And when I went back to that second draft, oh my God, it's the best part. Like you're polishing it, you're molding it, you're shaping the word choice, just all of a sudden it's like, boom. I do believe though, you do need to separate yourself from your manuscript at some point. You know, sometimes you just need to like get out of the chair and go for a walk. Whatever inspires you, whatever, you know, gets your creative juices flowing. Um, you know, take a walk outside, just get some fresh air, breathe through it. You know, writing is also, I've decided, thinking days. You, you, you know, yes, we have to be writing every single day, but there are those days where you have to really, if something's not coming to you, you have to really sit back and think about it. Think about your plot in your head, you know, write scenarios on a piece of paper and then come back to it. But you gotta come back to it. Marilyn? Um, I, if I get stuck, I get up, I go to the fridge, <laughs> I take out the Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> Once there's none left, I go back and sit in the chair again. I really believe in breaking, um, even if it's, mm -hmm. you know, jerk society, even if it's like to go outside for a walk yeah. Yeah. or to call a friend, just get my head completely out of it because I don't, I can't force it, you know, it's just, as you know, because you're writing, it, it, it Yes, you have to work. I mean, people say, uh, you know, you meet somebody at a party and they say, at a party and they'll say, I really, I really want to be a writer. When you say you're a writer. And then I say, well, do you write? Oh, no. You know, so yes, you have to be a writer, you have to write. But there are also times when you just can't do it. And, and if that's the time for me that I take a break. And see, the, the bottom line is you do what works for you. 
Mm -hmm. because we all have our own processes we all have our own ways of getting words on the page some people write write clean i have a friend who edits every chapter she goes ends up with a complete clean manuscript and off it goes to our agent i'm a big rewriter i have to mm -hmm. keep writing rewriting 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 so writing whatever rewriting. But, but you know these ladies are right if there's a day when it's really not happening it's okay to walk away and, and put your brain somewhere else i garden i go outside I feel like sometimes you come to it with fresh eyes. Yeah, exactly. you know when when we submit our manuscripts and we haven't touched it in like let's say three weeks yeah. and then it comes back to you, how fresh yeah. are your eyes? Yeah. You're mm -hmm. like, oh my god, how did I miss that? You have an epiphany. You see it from a completely different yeah. perspective. I haven't touched the Gin Club since before since early November. That's one that's on submission. Tell everybody what Gin Club is about. Yeah, well, we've got five minutes, so... Um, oh, unless there's more questions, I'm sorry. I think... Did anyone have another question, or are we going to answer um, the question over here about um, what you're working, working on? What you're working on. Thank you. My mind just went, you know. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't eaten much today, so you my stomach's rumbling and my brain's going, oh, it's gym time. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what are you working on? I'm working, I'm at the very, very beginning of a story about a professional, a uh, woman who's a professional. She's, uh, right now she's a podiatrist. She could be an actress <laughs> next week. <laughs> and they're so similar in tone. Because, you know? yeah, yeah. And you can use the jokes, the same ones. So um, she was actually an actress two weeks ago, and then I got into her being a podiatrist. That's how at the beginning I am. But I like the basics of the story is... She has one daughter. The daughter has one child. She is in, finds herself in competition with her son-in-law's mother and the new wife of her ex-husband, who is a 22-year-old part-time personal trainer, but the kid calls her grandma. So the story is their competition, her competition to try to be number one grandma while still maintaining her professional life. And that's as far as I've got. There is no Chinese restaurant in it. <laughs> Rochelle, we have two minutes. Two minutes, so okay. The closing. I, okay, so this book's coming out spring of 2023. It is a Rolling Stone reporter who is trying to unearth the muse and inspiration for one of the most famous love songs of our time. Dual timeline, 70s, 90s, lots of music, love, angst, whatnot. And the gin cup is a father-son story about teenage bullies, middle-aged heroes, Woo! and a drunk groundhog. And it's set here in Orange County. Mm -hmm. What and does the mother-daughter one? Oh, the mother-daughter one. The one I'm working on at the moment is an addiction recovery story. Mm -hmm. and my hero heroine is a brilliant mm -hmm. neuroscientist at Duke who had a minor work injury and accidentally became an opioid addict. And it's about her trying to repair her relationship with her teen daughter. Um, and her teen daughter doesn't want anything to do with her, even though she's been clean and sober for eight months. And then she, has, the teen daughter ends up in a relationship with her father's charismatic, Harvard-bound project protege, who everything except everyone except my heroine thinks is wonderful. She has doubts about him, and turns out that he's actually gaslighting her daughter, who's emotionally abusive. No, and no one will listen to my heroine. And then she discovers he's a pill pusher on top of all that. So, yeah, it's you know another light story, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a motherhood story. So Thank there you go. Thank you all for coming.